Uh, greetings and welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Le Chevalier. I'm Associate Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with us, Lumen Christi was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a vital part of the university and our broader society through courses, lectures, symposia, and summer seminars. We are committed in our work to presenting the breadth and depth of the Catholic intellectual tradition, and thus are excited to be hosting this series, highlighting the scholarship of those who work in the Catholic, who work in the Eastern Christian tradition. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture. Uh, I'd invite you to tune in again next week, Thursday at 7 p.m., as we welcome an old friend of the Institute, Robin Darling Young, for a presentation entitled Christ the Lover of Mankind, Philanthropia, Mystery, and Martyria in Eastern Christianity. I'm grateful to the many co-sponsors who have made this series a success. This series is being co-presented with the Godbearer Institute and co-sponsored by the Beatrice Institute, the Calvert House Catholic Center, the Catholic Theological Union, the Institute for Faith and Culture, God With Us Online, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University, the St. Benedict Institute, the St. Paul University Catholic Center, St. Stephen Byzantian Catholic Church, and the Tabor Life Institute. You too can help support us to make our events a success. First, if you have uh, the ability, help get word out to your friends and parishes, or follow us on social media and retweet or share our Facebook announcements there, or even like uh, this video if you're following it on YouTube right now, and help drive up the analytics so that more people can learn about these great programs. You can also help financially support our work at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind is helpful. Let's now turn to today's event. To introduce our speaker and moderate our conversation, I'll hand it over to Father Andrew Summerson, co-organizer of the series, priest in the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Parma, serving St. Mary's Parish in Whitting, Indiana, and a patristic scholar of his own right. Father Andrew, I invite you to unmute yourself and to turn on your screen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome everybody to our second installment of Eastern Catholic Theology in Action. As you might have read in the introduction to the series, that there are 23 Eastern churches in communion with the Roman Catholic Church, distinct in their liturgy, theology, spirituality, discipline, and church life, right? Often throughout the pontificate of now Saint Pope John Paul II, he spoke of the two lungs with which the church needs to breathe, an Eastern lung and a Western lung. However, the church, is more than two lungs. Great Syriac uh, scholar Sebastian Brock tells us that unlike the human body, the mystical body of Christ has these lungs of the Eastern Church and argues that the Syriac lung is indeed a third lung of the church. So we have for us tonight to expose us to the work of Saint Ephraim the Syrian, the finest author uh, of the Syriac tradition, Dr. Andrew Hayes. Here, Dr. Andrew Hayes received his PhD at the Catholic University of America, and he is currently Division Dean of Liberal Studies and Associate Professor of Theology at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Dr. Hayes conducts research on Syriac patristics and on related theological and literary traditions. Syriac, a dialect of the Aramaic language, serves as the vehicle for the major tradition of Christian literature and culture in the Near East from the early period until today. Dr. Hayes specializes particularly in asceticism, spirituality, and the theological poetics and the thought of St. Ephraim the Syrian are subject today. He has published and presented research in areas of the early Syriac fathers, Jacob of Shurug, Philonexus of Mabug, and he is currently a deacon candidate as well for the Melkite Eparchy of Newton. I will remind all of you that at the conclusion of Dr. Hayes' talk, uh, he will be able to answer our questions and you have the ability to type questions as you think of them 
at the bottom of your screen, clicking on the Q&A function of the Zoom window. So I'll now invite uh, Dr. Andrew Hayes uh, to unmute himself and show us his video as he begins to introduce us to the theology of wonder in the writings of Ephraim the Syrian. Thank you so much, Father. I'm I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to um, uh, to present uh, Saint Ephraim the Syrian to this uh, to this audience and in this uh, this forum. And uh, before we we get into the 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 meat of the lecture, I'd like to to point out that this presentation will dovetail very nicely with uh, the previous week's lecture on liturgical mystagogy because. Uh, we move from the uh, liturgical mystagogy to now an example of what a liturgically inspired theology looks like in practice. And that really, that, that would be an apt description of uh, St. Ephraim's theological approach and, um, and how it is actually um, uh, uh, put into uh, the living uh, thought of the church, not simply as words on a page or lectures in a classroom, but, but in a liturgical form. And <clears throat> I, uh, I couldn't agree more with Father Andrew's point that the Syriac tradition really is vital to the Catholicity of the whole, uh, of the whole church. And it's very important for us to uh, take advantage of the wisdom of St. Ephraim the Syrian as we seek to embrace that full Catholicity. Uh, one other note before I, I actually launch the presentation, I'm, I'm aware that there may be some folks who belong to those Syriac traditions of the church uh, the, and are familiar with the language and liturgy that we're calling Syriac, but I, I want to um, point out that the way I pronounce Syriac may not be uh, familiar to all. There are, some, uh, there are a couple different traditions of spelling and pronunciation. And I'm following prevailing uh, scholarly custom in uh, using what we think is the the uh, older way of pronouncing and uh, and spelling Syriac. So if it seems a little unfamiliar to those of you who belong to the Syriac traditions, that's why. And I'm not making any uh, claims or judgments about the right way to pronounce things or or, or spell things. Just uh, how I'm um, I'm just following prevailing custom. So with that. Let's um, uh, go ahead and begin the lecture itself. So I've entitled this talk A, a Theology of Wonder, and that's because the interplay uh, between human wonder and divine glory is really one of the most distinctive characteristics of theological reflection in the writings of St. Ephraim the Syrian, and therefore of the larger Syriac theological and spiritual tradition he inaugurates. And considering that interplay between wonder and glory really illuminates the Syriac church's collective preference for expressing theological reflection in poetic and symbolic genres rather than the discursive prose familiar in other traditions. And I, it was the best way that I think we can show concretely Ephraim's theology at work. And so the, the talk has two primary goals, as, I, as I've uh, outlined here on the slide. The first, to introduce briefly the poetry of St. Ephraim, its time, its likely context, its features. And second, and uh, primarily, to argue that the animating principle of his poetic theology, considered in its human dimension, is the cultivated state of wonder. Now, Ephraim stands at the beginning of an extraordinarily broad and vibrant theological and cultural tradition, which is closely linked to the Jewish intellectual traditions of Mesopotamia, but with literary roots that stretch back even further as far as ancient Sumer, and thus to the dawn of human civilization. Now, Ephraim's Syriac is a particular literary dialect of Aramaic belonging to the probable cradle of Christianity in Mesopotamia, the city of Orhai, known to Greek speakers as Edessa. You can see it here on the map, circled in red. 
Thus, his epithet, the Syrian, does not reflect an origin within the modern state or the ancient province of Syria, but refers instead to his language and culture. Ephraim himself came from a city called Nisibis, an ancient city to the east of Edessa, which at the time of his birth, estimated at 306 AD, stood on the border between the Roman and Persian empires. And the evidence suggests that he himself was a member of the Sons of the Covenant in Syriac, the Benai Qiyama, an ancient institution whose members communally undertook the life of singleness in the service of the church and in the imitation of Christ. He describes himself uh, as a pastoral assistant to his bishops. Literally, he calls himself a herdsman. The Syriac word is alana, a herdsman for the bishop, the ra'ya, the shepherd. He also describes himself as a teacher and composer of madrashe. And later tradition, in fact, also remembers him as a director of choirs, particularly for women, most likely Benath Qiyama, who are the female ascetic counterparts of the Benai Qiyama. So you have the sons of the covenant and the daughters of the covenant. Um, but it's important to uh, note something. Those of you who will be familiar with the Byzantine tradition may have seen icons of St. Ephraim like the one that I've put up on the screen. This is a traditional depiction of the death of St. Ephraim in the city of Edessa. And uh, you'll notice that he is surrounded by people in monastic cowls, and he himself appears to be wearing a monastic cowl. But uh, the best evidence that we have uh, has shown that, in fact, Ephraim was not a monk in the Byzantine sense of the word. Being a member of the covenant in the Syriac terminology was roughly analogous to being a, a, a religious, but it, it wasn't the same thing as the kind of hermit who would go out into the desert and spend his time in solitary prayer. Uh, so it's uh, what we are going to be looking at uh, when we look at Ephraim is an ascetically inspired theology, but one with a different flavor from the Byzantine monasticism with which some in the audience may be familiar. Now, Ephraim's prolific literary output spans several genres, in fact, uh, including prose, but his numerous poetic works fall into three categories. The first are the madrashe, which we've already mentioned. In fact, he thought of himself primarily as a composer of madrashe. These are stanzaic poems. They have isosyllabic kola, meaning each section of the line it consists of an equal number of syllables, and they have a refrain. Uh, there are also, in Ephraim's writings, uh, a relatively small number of memre. These are non-stanzaic discourses, but they're also isosyllabic, and they range from about 200 to 700 lines. In later Syriac tradition, memre become very common, and they also become even longer. Uh, so much of the later Syriac tradition uh, wrote many memre, uh, and there are some very fine examples in, for example, the writings of Jacob of Sarug or, or Narsai and others. Uh, the third type of poetry that Ephraim wrote were Sokiyatha. These are stanzaic again, just like the Madrashe, they're, but they're dialogue poems. And in them, we have two characters. Sometimes they're biblical characters. Sometimes they're personifications. They argue back and forth. These Sokiyatha are really interesting in their own right, although we won't look at any examples tonight. Uh, but they are a sort of subcategory of, of the uh, larger genre of Madrasha. And Ephraim's madrashe are marked especially by a delight in paradox and a penchant for polarity, which is the use of terms in some kind of opposing balance. And you're going to notice this feature throughout the, uh, the texts that I'm bringing to your attention this evening. Uh, there you'll see a sort of contrasting balance between, for example, the hidden versus the revealed or the image and its archetype, creatures terrestrial versus creatures celestial, uh, polarity between paradise and the inhabited world, and so on and so forth. Ephraim's madrashe also explicitly serve a didactic and exegetical function, both as evidenced by the very root of the term, which is cognate with the Hebrew word midrash, and by his own affirmation that he regarded his madrashe rather than his brief prose commentary on uh, as the principal expression of his exegesis on Genesis. So he wrote prose commentaries, uh, 
but in his own thinking, the Madrashe were his commentaries on the scriptures. And additionally, one finds in these Madrashe that there are many cases in which Ephraim appears to be addressing his own community in a didactic context. So there's the didactic element of his works, but at the same time, it's also clear that many of his works were intended for liturgical use. Later tradition mentions that fact, and it also arranged Ephraim's madrasha in books of cycles that in many cases reflect a liturgical function. So for example, there's a collection of madrasha on the fast, and those are pretty clearly intended for use during Lent. And even now, excerpts from Ephraim's madrasha continue to be used liturgically, so it's still part of the liturgical tradition of the Syriac churches. The origin itself, the origin of the genre itself, excuse me, is lost in the mists of time. But one interesting thing about Ephraim is that he may have been the first to turn these compositions into actual songs, uh, in part at least to counteract the influence of proponents of erroneous views who'd already adopted the genre for their own purposes. And unfortunately, Although the manuscript collections do preserve uh, the melodies uh, by giving the incipit of a well-known hymn to, with each of his madrashe, we don't know exactly what they would have sounded like in the fourth century. So the takeaway from this is that the type of poetry Ephraim is most famous for, the madrasha, is on the one hand didactic and on the other hand liturgical. By far the bulk of his compositions are madrashe and uh, we're going to base the rest of the talk tonight primarily on examples from Madrasha. As Father Sidney Griffith has so aptly put it, the Madrasha is, quote, the most Aramean of literary genres. And before turning to the concept of wonder in Ephraim's thought and concluding this all too brief introduction to his poetic forms for expressing it, I want to note one more important thing that Ephraim himself imagined his Madrasha as a genre that was simultaneously aural and visual. So on the one hand, we have numerous references to them as songs, zimiratha in Syriac, accompanied by the lyre or the harp, and he consciously adopts the persona of the prophet David regarding such singing as healing to the soul, much as David healed Saul's interior torment through his own melodies. But at the same time, Ephraim's madrashe are filled with artistic devices, which would be most readily perceived by someone reading them. And Ephraim also loves to describe himself as an iconographer or image maker with words, following the lead of God, who, as an artist, inscribes and paints all of creation with his own symbols. And that mention of the term symbols is an opportunity for me to put up here on the screen uh, some key terminology that we're going to see throughout the, the texts that are cited in this talk, uh, terminology for wonder, references to nature and scripture, but in particular, uh, a term which is ubiquitous in Ephraim's poetry, raza, a symbol or mystery, but it also means a sacrament, uh, similar to the Greek word mysterion, but with a much wider range of use. And um, it's going to be in terms of raza that all of Ephraim's theology unfolds in terms of these symbols. So sometimes Ephraim's theology is described as an image theology, a build theology, or a symbolic theology. Now, in order to speak of Ephraim's theology of wonder, it is necessary first to consider his view on the sources for experiencing it. And for Ephraim, wonder arises from an awareness precisely of these symbols, these raze of God, which are perceived above all in the twofold sources of nature, kiana, and kathava, scripture. So nature and scripture as the sources of these razde. Indeed, the book of Genesis, and specifically the paradise narrative, is in a special position because it brings together both sources. So Ephraim says that Moses wrote in his scripture the creation of the world of nature that both nature and scripture might serve as witnesses to the creator. Nature in its being used and scripture in its being read. These are witnesses which reach to every region, which appear in every time and remain certain in every moment. They rebuke the unbeliever who slanders the creator. So right away we see the, the nature and scripture as the sources 
of theological reflection and insight. And the slander to which Ephraim refers is that of dualists who in his day rejected the goodness of creation and also the unity of the Old and the New Testament across salvation history. But the value of Genesis lies not simply in refuting certain errors, not simply in refuting dualists, in other words. There is, if we may say so, a certain primacy of protology in Ephraim's thinking. That is to say, uh, Genesis, because it is the scripture of creation, is a privileged source for insight into God's raze, into God's symbols, for the simple reason that it is the source of all of them. It is the source of sources. And so as Ephraim meditates on Genesis, he exclaims, the keys of doctrine which open all the scriptures have opened before my eyes the scripture of creation, the sephra de veriatha the book which above its companions by its account has perceived the maker and presented his handiwork, has seen all of his adornments and demonstrated his artistry. So Ephraim's point here is that Genesis and paradise in particular within the Genesis narrative surpass the other scriptures in as much as they reveal the nature scripture source in its pristine unity and clarity prior to the distortions caused by sin. Here, above all else, are found God's trademark or signature symbols, his raze. Everything that is, because it is from God, is a symbol of him. And consequently, the symbolism and typology that Ephraim will use to adorn his own poems flows from the very mystery of creation itself. As God created the world, Ephraim says, he looked upon it and it was adorned with his icons. The fountains of his symbols were opened, the Mabo'ed Razal. They flowed and poured his symbols upon its various parts. Notice that language of the fountain of symbols, the fountain of Raze. Like the fountain, the Mabo'a, described in Genesis 2.6, which watered the whole face of the earth, God's own creative power pours forth symbols throughout the world for the refreshment of those who gaze upon them. But unfortunately, there are some in the church who by their controversy have willfully taken that pristine clear spring of symbols and muddied and clouded the spring and then eagerly proceeded to drink the contaminated fountain that they themselves have created. And so Ephraim says, by, in describing this, the one in the beginning resembles the other. And John is like Moses, who at the beginning of his books rebuked the bookish who have debated maliciously. For the one proclaimed God who was coming to suffer, and Moses proclaimed nature which was coming to pain, lest the hearers of the books themselves be afflicted with illness 
at the opening of their books, each wrote of their beauties. So we have there that notion of the pristine character of creation and also of the Son of God. But then notice this key development. O oh, wellspring of wonder, Maboa de Thazmorta, which is clear or disturbed depending on the side from which it is experienced. For it is entirely limpid to those who are limpid, since by its limpid water they are made limpid. Whereas to the disturbed, it is cloudy because they are clouded, just as sweetness is bitter to those who are sick. The truth is cloudy among the disputatious, like sweetness among the sick. Our Lord, heal our sickness, that with sweet delight we may hear the account of you. So the way in which people experience the wellsprings, both of scripture and of nature, depends on the willful disposition they cultivate when engaging with them. Those who defame the goodness of creation by ascribing evil to the creator are like those, Ephraim says, who, mal who debate maliciously about the supposed createdness of the Son of God. In both cases, neither the evils that creation suffers as a result of human sin nor the sufferings of the Son of God are proof that the creation is evil or that the Son of God is a creature. In both cases, they misinterpret both nature and scripture because of the sickness of their own fallenness. And notice that it's precisely at that juncture that Ephraim consciously associates nature and scripture, the sources of theological reflection, with the experience of wonder, which thus turns out to be central to his understanding of the practice of theology in the pilgrim state of the church. And the images of the fountain of symbols and the wellspring of wonder um, they themselves are an allusion back to paradise, which Ephraim routinely describes using fountain language. He speaks of the well of Eden, the Neva de Eden, the free flowing fountains of paradise, the Mabo Eshraya, which God nevertheless constrains by his merciful power that their flows might reach the inhabited world. And paradise itself, he describes as luminous and unclouded in the way that a spring would be clear and unclouded. He describes it as Shafia filled with uh, waves of glory in which the contemplative might swim or streams of glory from which one might drink and in both cases become inebriated by the divine wisdom. Thus, paradise for Ephraim is the archetypal font of divine blessings to humanity untainted by human audacity. And this paradise imagery allows him to connect the fountains of symbols, the fountains of Raze, with the greatest Raza, which is the Eucharist, because remember, the word Raza means symbol, but it also means sacrament. In the Eucharist, fire and spirit are poured, Ephraim says, into the hands of his disciples, an experience which he also calls, not too surprisingly now that we've seen what uh, he says about the fountain of wonder, he describes the Eucharist itself as a singular wonder, a tehra prisha. So drinking from the sources of theological reflection, nature and scripture, finds its consummation in drinking from the Eucharistic chalice. Theological reflection is consummated liturgically. So, as Ephraim himself makes clear, whether we approach the wellsprings appropriately and profitably depends on our disposition. So the logical question to ask is thus, what's the proper disposition in which to approach these wellsprings? of scripture and nature. And briefly put the answer to that, the proper way to approach the wellspring of wonder is the state of wonder. And Ephraim himself models that, that practice of wonder, that state of wonder, most conspicuously in the Madrashe on Paradise. And one crucial thing that we're going to discover when we look at what he does in those Madrashe is that wonder particularly characterizes those moments associated with crossing the threshold between the poles of Ephraim's many polarities. That is, we find it when a creature sort of comes out into the middle of that creator-creature polarity, or when it crosses the boundary between the inhabited world and paradise for which the creator-creature polarity is the archetype. And to make that make sense, we're going to look at the specific case in which Ephraim demonstrates the process of theological contemplation for us. This is in the fifth madrasha on paradise. And in it, Ephraim describes in sequence a series uh, of his own interior actions 
as he reads the Paradise narrative. The first thing, of course, is where we start. We have to read the narrative. So he says, I read, Qurayt. But then, as a result of his reading, he says, I overflowed, Ishtarqaf. And then he describes himself as, through his reading, through the scripture, crossing the bridge into paradise. And it's at that point that he can say, I saw, I saw the beauties of paradise. And his response to that, after having described the beauties of paradise, which he has seen through his scriptural reading and his, his prayerful reading of scripture, he simply says, I glorified Shabbat. And then at the end, and he does this twice, I think for emphasis, he says, I wondered, Temheth. And when we, so we, we see here the sort of progression of, of theological reflection. It starts with reading, it then the initial reaction of overflowing, of ex, almost ecstasy in that act of, uh, of uh, uh, spiritual reading of the scriptures, the vision, the glorification, and then finally it, its consummation in wonder. And when we examine more closely that last act of Ephraim's wondering, we realize that it comes at the end because it is the fruit of his reflections, but it also appears just as he crosses that threshold from paradise to the inhabited world. So he's on his way out of the state, uh, out of the action of contemplation, and he says, I wondered at how as I crossed the boundary of paradise, well-being, my companion stopped and turned back. And when I reached the border of the earth, the mother of thorns, pains and sufferings of every kind greeted me. But then he goes on to repeat this wonder. I wondered too, he says, at how infants weep upon their coming forth. They weep because they come forth from darkness to light and from suffocation into the world. In the same way, death in regard to the world is a symbol of birth. And yet people weep when they are born from the inhabited world, the mother of sufferings into the garden of delights. So what we see here is death as birth. And what we see in particular with regard to wonder is that it is wonder that marks that transition between the states. It marks that moment of special theological insight into the meaning of life, death, and rebirth that occurs within that liminal space. Now, the poet also enters this liminal experience when crossing in the other direction. Here in this example, it's when he's uh, crossing from paradise to the inhabited world. But in the sixth madrasha on paradise, when he begins to read the paradise narrative with his eyes opened and his mind enters via the bridge of the text, then at that very moment of crossing, he, he says again, the mind which is spiritual when it entered wondered and marveled, tama wathahar. So he, again, it's a double wonder as he crosses that boundary. And he wonders precisely, as he explains in that text, precisely because the mind's senses were no longer able to perform their natural functions. And what's interesting about this is that it was the natural beauty of paradise which incited that wonder in him. But the wonder only increases Ephraim's not done wondering. His wonder only increases as he reaches another point of transition, and he makes a comparison. If the beauty of paradise incites wonder in us, how much more then should the beauty of the mind, the shufra, the ra'yana, incite us to wonder? For the one is the result of nature and the other of will. Freedom, he says, envied the garden, and she sprouted of herself and proffered victorious fruits whose crowns surpassed the adornments of paradise. So notice what he's doing here. Ephraim wonders as he crosses the threshold of paradise, and then he wonders again as he crosses yet another threshold, th that threshold between the beauty of nature and the beauty of free will, and the one beauty is a symbol of the other. So the symbols draw him from one level of wonder to the next. And Ephraim's not done uh, with this. He then proceeds to give an example of the victory of free will that he's talking about. And his example is Elias the prophet. And this time it is the angels who are filled with wonder at his bodily translation from the world to paradise, which transition itself symbolizes the incarnation. One of them, he says, split the air with his chariot, the watchers, 
that's an interesting a point just as an aside the watchers is the the early syriac term for the angels so the watchers eagerly met him for they saw for the first time a body in their dwelling place and how an earthbound one clothed himself in the divine radiance and ascended in a chariot the lord in his benevolence clothed himself with a body and descended and then mounted a cloud and rode it upward reigning both above and below and it is then at this point that Ephraim brings in the wonder of the angels. The watchers of fire and spirit wondered at Elias, for they saw that hidden in him was the delightful treasure. At Adam's clay, they wondered and praised its fashioner. They saw virginity and rejoiced that she had exalted those below and caused wonder to those above. Her struggle is on earth, but her crown is in paradise. Remember, he's in the context of talking about the victories of free will. Elias serves as his symbol of that. And we see here once again, as in the previous examples, wonder marking the liminality of paradox appearing in Elias's own struggle, but also in the whole course of the incarnate words condescension and ascension, as well as in the exaltation of contemporary ascetic practitioners in the churches. And it's important to note too that this is not a bare expression of, a, of pious admiration, but a real theological connection Ephraim is making between a type or symbol or raza in the Old Testament to its fulfillment in Christ, to its extension to the time of the church as a sign of the kingdom to come. And Ephraim adopts a similar posture of wonder in another text, uh, much shorter, in which he considers the link between creation and its restoration. And so once again, wonder is associated with this <coughs> in-betweenness. In wisdom, he says elsewhere, you created freedom, Lord, and in cleverness, you healed it for us between the two sides. I wonder at both wisdoms. So even though the exegetical context in that briefer quotation is different, once again, Ephraim is situating his theological reflection in between two poles, in this case, between the original creation and its renewal. And it is the state of wonder precisely that marks that in-betweenness. Um, so for Ephraim, theological reflection is not just uh, something that we do, but something that God himself must uh, initiate by his own descent to us. And thus, while it is the proper response of the creature drawn to the liminal state, wonder also characterizes God's acts of self-disclosure. So in language that is reminiscent of the 20 of the uh, of paradise in the 26th madrasha on faith ephraim puts it this way the flavors of his words are singular that they might rebuke the ears of the foolish and the likenesses of his face are wondrous that its beauty might entice the eyes of the immature for although it, he is always the self same since he neither grows nor diminishes he is not who is not small becomes so in order to make us great. So the wonder of the divine face, Ephraim suggests here, is magnified by its many likenesses, but its real goal is to magnify us. And as the wording of tastes indicates, Ephraim also regards divine wonder as nourishing the person. The denizens of uh, paradise, uh, he says, gorge themselves constantly upon the wonder of his majesty. And a few stanzas later, he describes the, the, their meal as gorging on a pasture of visions, fattening and becoming drunk on waves of glory. And in fact, that same glory is what Moses experienced on Sinai, as Ephraim elsewhere describes. Here's an interesting example. Because of the counsel of love, I wondered and completely scorned silence, it told me, and by the way, it's love speaking to Ephraim. That's uh, part of the way he sets this up. Uh, it told me, look at John, who with his love covered over his terror, his great fear with fervor, and still silence with his voice. And up to the great summit of divinity, he was exalted without fear and lay his head upon the terrifying breast. He asked about the hidden secret and received its manifest explanation praiseworthy is the one who magnified and delighted the speaker more than those who remained silent. And then he brings in Moses. Moses before God acted boldly so as to see his glory. 
God forbade him. This is very audacious to, to think God forbade him, but he was not ashamed until he saw him and was made radiant. So notice how in the internal dialectic, the internal back and forth, if you will, of theological contemplation love and wonder are the dynamic forces pulling us godward and by preceding theological questioning it even safeguards it in the one who is fed by divine doctrine that it might be fulfilled in transfiguring enlightenment as in the case of john the evangelist and moses But wonder is not just a contemplative principle, a sort of dynamism, dynamic uh, engine of our contemplation. It also serves as an ascetical principle in theological reflection. One of the important characteristics of the state of wonder that we've only hinted at up to this point is that it is a voluntary condition, one that can be freely entered into or deliberately abandoned. It is thus both antithesis to and antidote for the condition of investigation, a problem which is described by the, a whole range of vocabulary in Syriac, but we see it um, brought up uh, here, particularly in this madrasha on faith number 46. The wonder is, Ephraim says, that God has bent down to mere dirt, adorned it with life, magnified it with freedom, handed over his son in its be on its behalf in order to show it his love. And instead of wondering at how great he is, and if he had wondered and kept silent, it would have been too little, it presents to the honored one, that is to say to God, the comical flattery of its investigations. So Ephraim's vocabulary of adornment, of life, of freedom, that's all paradise language that we've seen before in the previous examples. And that provides the backdrop for his critique of investigation as the comical inversion of Edenic wonder, the sort of reverse, the caricature of Edenic wonder, which in the, the, the wonder that we experience in Eden, even if it does not reach up to the point of comprehending God, at least approaches him in the right context. And the fact that wonder is the opposite of investigation, they're the op, they're, it's the opposite pole of investigation, is a crucial point to understand because it sheds light on where uh, we go wrong in the practice of theology and how that going wrong might be corrected. And to show this, we're going to look at a really fascinating exegesis of the story of Balaam, the seer in the book of Numbers. Because Balaam, Ephraim says, had become a fool, indeed he became a foolish beast, by means of his donkey, God spoke with him who had scorned God. So the, the particular biblical story is that Balaam has been um, uh, sent to curse Israel, and he is rebuked by 
God creating this miracle of his donkey speaking to him. And Ephraim notices something interesting about this particular example. Balaam becomes here a type, a symbol, if you will, for the irrational disregard for God, the scorning of God that Ephraim sees as the animating principle of investigation. So the the, the where theological investigation goes awry is in this scorn for God. But it becomes a little bit more clear when we look at another example where he talks about Balaam and Balaam's irrationality. When all of a sudden the donkey spoke, Balaam saw the marvel and he abandoned wonder as to how it was that the mouth of the donkey had become capable of speech, that is to say had become rational. And, and if, you, if you go back to look at the text, it really is quite striking because when the donkey speaks to Balaam, Balaam doesn't notice the most obvious thing, which is, oh my goodness, how is this irrational animal now talking? Balaam actually argues with the donkey. And that is Ephraim's point, that Balaam had gone astray and he was arguing with his ass. And the scribes, too, he says, making a comparison now to the scribes in the Gospel of John, the scribes, too, they abandoned wonder. The blind were open. So he's referring now to the story of the man born blind. And instead of paying attention to that and marveling at it and wondering at that, they stirred up an investigation about the Sabbath and the clay. So the language of abandoning wonder and scorning God makes clear that the failure here is not a failure to see the mysteries of God, but it is instead a deliberate disregard for them, which Ephraim is very careful to characterize as irrational. That is, it's not that Balaam in the book of Numbers or the scribes in the Gospel of John and the story of the man born blind, it's not that they were not keen-sighted enough or had failed in some sort of methodological way. It's not simply that they're mistaken, nor was theirs a failure to balance reason and faith as sources of theological reflection, theirs was a failure to discipline their will such that they deliberately abandoned the state of wonder where theological contemplation should reside. Now, uh, that the fact that investigation is an abuse of free will dovetails perfectly with Ephraim's own accounting for evil. It comes, evil that is, comes not from the natural state, which in this case would be the wonder experienced in Eden, but is introduced by our will. And this means that like all abuses of free will, we must bridle and restrain our impetuosity with the discipline of asceticism. Not only an asceticism of the body, there is that to be sure, yes, but in this case, an asceticism that disciplines our reflection and our contemplation. Ephraim's first memra on the faith models this approach from its very first lines. He says, I wonder, and once he has this way of loving to repeat the notion of wonder to emphasize it, doesn't he? I wonder at our audacity to what a height it scales. I wonder not that it reached the height, but that it supposed it could. The investigators supposed that they had comprehended God. And you see right there, that's the audacity that he is uh, taking issue with, that laugh laughable um, notion that it would be possible to, to comprehend God. So the investigators supposed that they had comprehended God, but not because they supposed so did they actually manage it for the creator of all minds, the Baroya, the Choryanin, is higher than every mind. So the failure in theological inquiry comes from a deliberate rejection of the creator-creature distinction, or as Ephraim elsewhere loves to describe it as the chasm between creator and creatures. So Ephraim's advice for the cure uh, of this audacity is very easy to understand. At the very end of this same memra, he sums it up this way. Put bridles on your investigation that it not run wild like a beast. And that language of, of beast, um, uh, of running wild like a beast should make, us, make it clear that what we're seeing is uh, the irrationality of investigation. He goes on to say, there are voluntary bridles and there are compulsory bridles. It belongs to your own will to rebuke the impulsiveness of your freedom. 
but the compulsory bridles belong to your Lord, so that even if you act audaciously, you are too weak. Whether you will it or not, the bridles of your Lord are placed on you. Wherever your course goes, bring yourself to a stop, a weakling. So Ephraim leaves no doubt that the problem of investigation is not a methodological problem, but the impetus of an irrational will the cure for which is found in the discipline of wonder. But as Ephraim's descriptions of paradise also makes clear, that restraint, that discipline, which is necessary in theological reflection, it does in fact prove to be a delightfully liberating condition. The freedom to drink from the very wellspring of wonder, and in so drinking to be enlightened, nourished, and transfigured by the light of glory. So what does this? what does Syriac theology look like in practice, in action, it looks like Moses and it looks like John. Moses fasting on Sinai, John reclining on the breast of our Lord at the mystical supper. These are the icons of theological praxis for Ephraim. So this brief tour of Ephraim's theological praxis has revealed it uh, to be a theology of wonder. It, It begins in the double source of theological reflection, scripture nature, which Ephraim regards as a wellspring of wonder and a fountain of symbols, which must consequently be approached in the state of wonder. And such wonder, forgetful of self, forms a posture of engagement, punctuating the transitions from one contemplative insight to the next, as God draws the seeker of wisdom to himself by the enticing beauty of his own wondrous countenance. And this posture also concretely embodies the in-betweenness of the theological act in which a created intelligence keenly aware of its own limitations thus declines to limit God by his own conceptions, but does dare to seek the face of God and be transfigured by the light that is in his presence, as the book of Daniel describes it. So the human creature, Ephraim is clear, indeed may seek wisdom, even the hidden secrets of God, provided he disciplines the aberrant inclination for knowledge by his wonder. And in rationally acknowledging his reason's dependence on the uncreated wisdom of God, it becomes ever more rational and human. One of the things that's interesting about this is that the wonder is discursive. It's, it's moving from one step to the next. It's thinking. It's not unthinking wonder, but it does in the end give way to a mystic silence. Investigation, which is the attempt to exercise reason without wonder, is merely a comical and sub-rational parody of the mind's true grandeur. This is what is meant by describing wonder as an ascetical principle, that the mind and its impulse, the passion for knowledge, must be disciplined just as much, and indeed, Ephraim thinks, in a way quite parallel to, the passion for food and drink must be disciplined. Now, by the usual definition of the term, Ephraim is not a systematic thinker. He does not parse his writings into the topical divisions that one might find in a textbook or an encyclopedia. Rather, his artistry is consistent in the way that the theological aesthetic of icons is consistent. It adheres to certain canons of expression and symbolism which form a coherent worldview and a consistent sapiential approach to the mysteries of God. And among Ephraim's canons, or if you like, principles, are the polarity between the creator and creature, the dynamic counterpoint between human wonder and divine glory, and the dramatic tension between the inhabited world and paradise. So a resourcement for a Catholic Syriac theology would thus eschew foreign categories such as nature versus grace or faith versus reason and attend instead to the unified but multi-streamed source of symbols, nature and scripture, the wellspring of wonder, contextualized by an asceticism of the eyes and of the will, that is, by the wonder which disciplines the human passion for knowledge, which in our forefather Adam had gone astray, but which in the new Adam is now transfigured. And notice, this is a crucial point, that the opposing pole of faith in Ephraim's theological discipline is never reason. It's never faith versus reason for Ephraim. It's if there is an opposition to faith, it is investigation and investigation, as we have seen, is not the same as reason because its characteristic feature is precisely that it is irrational and subhuman. 
the result of a voluntary declination from wonder. So wonder is thus the point at which man returns to his natural way of relating to God, primed for the reception of the divine glory. And now that we've taken our tour through this theology of wonder, it's hardly surprising that the Syriac theological tradition as a whole prefers poetry. For theological expression. It is a theological tradition that is profoundly, supremely psalmodic, not just in its style, but in its very practice, because it sees the life of the mind as only unfolding in communion with God, and poetry is the effusion of wonder. Thank you. I'm going to uh, put as the last uh, bit here uh, some sources for those who might like to read a little further. Um, a few translations, uh, an excellent short introduction to Ephraim's theology, and then for those who want something a little bit more academic, a few articles that may be of interest along the lines of some of the things that we've talked about this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hayes, uh, for this beautiful Cook's tour through the uh, the world, the poetic world uh, of St. Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, we have a number of really excellent questions uh, that uh, you stimulated uh, with your talk. Uh, I begin just a little bit, a number of people, Robert O'Dell and uh, John Custer, um, wanted you to explore a little bit the Jewish connection. Robert O'Dell particularly asks, at the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned links between Syriac theology and Jewish, even Sumerian antecedents. Could you elaborate on these connections? How does the influence pan out? Is it linguistic, theological? Is there any liturgical influence that you can note uh, or any substantial religious influence from non-Jewish Mesopotamian sources even? Yeah, there's, <laughs> that's, um, a lot. there's a lot that could be said about it. Uh, just a few things. I, um, there's been some scholarship on liturgical influences. Um, uh, I can think of one article in particular that uh, has traced these. I myself, uh, not sure I could give examples, but I know that there's been that research on that. One of the most salient things, though, is the, the imagery that's shared between um, the Jewish and Syriac traditions. And uh, particularly, we find it in uh, the exegesis of the scripture. There's something very proximate to rabbinic exegesis in the, in the exegesis of St. Ephraim. So it's, it's especially in some of the symbols and in certain ways of treating biblical passages, like, for example, the, um, his, in his treatment of Exodus and the, the free will of Pharaoh, uh, is one example that I, I seem to recall, his, his descriptions of paradise filled with Jewish tradition. Um, 
uh, for, let's see, um, what would be an example? Oh, a, a simple one that um, the, uh, the notion of the levels in, um, in paradise, that, that the paradise is a mountain with different gradations or levels um, that is reflected in both Jewish and actually, I believe, ancient Babylonian sources, according to Father Robert Murray. So um, there's uh, a number of things in the imagery. It's more, the, the, tr the influence from the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian traditions is going to be literary rather than theological, uh, because, of course, uh, it's, it, Ephraim is you know, it's, uh, upholding orthodox theology. But some of the literary images, in his, especially in his dialogue poems, things that we didn't, weren't able to read tonight, uh, do uh, come from those ancient sources. So um, it, it's really quite broad. The best way to look into that is probably to read Father Murray's book, uh, Symbols of Church and Kingdom, which was not on my, uh, on my bibliography, but uh, it's, uh, it's a classic in the, in the field. Very good. Uh, questions about the relationship of Ephraim the Syrian to the Byzantine tradition. Uh, if I could just put a couple of questions together. Josiah Andrews, uh, just clarify a little bit um, uh, how Ephraim lived his monasticism, certainly not in the, the traditional form that we understand in the Byzantine tradition. And, and maybe perhaps if you could comment on Matthew Garcia's question, uh, where do you think uh, this uh, Byzantinization of Ephraim comes from? Maybe even speak a little bit about the prayer of St. Ephraim. Um, that yeah, I think Christians would know. Okay, so uh, what what we know about Ephraim's own form of ascetic praxis comes from his own writings and the writings of uh, other contemporaries. So it's kind of sketchy, but some of the more salient features are the fact that it's uh, uh, not Aramitic. It's so not uh, uh, going out alone into the desert as we have in the Egyptian tradition, for example. Um, and it's uh, instead communal, and it's consciously located in the within the heart of the community. So these these ascetics would undertake their their singleness uh, in the service of the church and in the service of the bishop. And we have examples of this in uh, not only in Ephraim but in certain early saints like uh, Abraham Kudunaya, who uh, was uh, also a fourth century Mesopotamian ascetic. And what's interesting is that he represents a transition between this uh, uh, original form of Syriac asceticism, this more ecclesiastical church serving, located in the local community, having a sort of missionary dimension. Um, he represents a sort of transition from, from those features of the native Syriac ascetic tradition to a, uh, embracing the influence of the Egyptian tradition and going off and becoming a hermit later in life. So in the life of Abraham Kidaniah, who died in um, uh, 367, it, but he, he he sort of represents that transition between uh, a communal uh, orientation to service, missionary work, and teaching, uh, and then the the switch to sort of flight from the world that becomes very characteristic of uh, later monastic tradition, uh, coming uh, influenced by uh, particularly the Egyptian um, desert fathers. Um, there was, um, so, so th those are some of the big differences. How, how, as to how the icon of Ephraim changed, that's a fascinating tale in its own right. Dissertations have been written on that. Um, but it appears that it's just natural for, uh, the, the simple explanation is it's natural for someone as famous as Ephraim to have attracted a lot of pseudonymous writings. And if your ideal of holiness is a certain way, it's easy to retroject that back onto a, a you know, famous hero that you might not know a whole lot about uh, if, his, if you don't read his original writings. So um, there's a large corpus of Greek texts in Ephraim that, although there's some relationship between a few texts in the Greek corpus and the Syriac writings of Ephraim, are probably uh, just at best inspired by him, and, and in many cases, simple simple misattributions, or perhaps we could say even um, uh, 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 deliberate uh, attributions to Ephraim. Uh, so, what emerged over time is just this very two a very different portrait or icon of Ephraim from what you find in his own in his own works, and it's it 
largely, I think, to be ascribed to the piety of those who knew of him and his fame and kind of imagined him the way they thought a saint should should be. And the the Syriac ascetic tradition died out um, it, for reasons that uh, are kind of hard to uh, grasp, except that perhaps we would say that the Egyptian monastic tradition was so appealing that it really came to dominate the consciousness of the of the Christian East. Wow. Um, I, I, I have a, a comment that I just want to interject because I was really struck by uh, the hymn, I believe, on Paradise, it, well, on Paradise with uh, Elias, uh, the prophet Elijah, uh, going in a prophetic way to heaven to show uh, human flesh uh, before Christ would come into his kingdom and his ascension, right? Uh, yeah. What a beautiful image. Uh, why do I think that's really interesting? Because in the Byzantine tradition, John the Baptist, his beheading, uh, the Troparian suggests that John the Baptist does the same thing, that he goes down in joy to Hades to proclaim to those who are entombed there that what? That Christ has appeared in the flesh, granting to the world his joy and great mercy, right? So there's a way in which that uh, uh, Ephraim wants to show us that this wonder uh, of the incarnation is meant for all creation and meant for all states, you know, from, you know, the heights of heaven to the, even the depths of Hades. Uh, could you talk about, uh, am I on, uh, is there something there? Well, um, I think that uh, the, what, what you, what Ephraim loves to do is uh, his, his theology has sometimes been described as a theology of totality. He loves titles and fra turns of phrase in which the, the the word all gets gets used so he's the uh, so god is described as the um the the one who enriches all for example right and and in that particular passage in the it's in the sixth hymn on paradise towards the end um he is he's doing one of the things he loves to do which is a spatial polarity so it's in in semitic uh, idiom when you have the two poles at opposite extremes, you're connoting, you're expressing the totality of the whole. It's a merism, right? And so uh, Christ is being described as reigning above and below. Uh, and I think it's really the same sentiment as what you described in the, the Traparian for John the Baptist, but perhaps just expressed in that characteristically Semitic idiom of a, of a, of a merism. Um, uh, the, so the important thing is that um, we see but but it's not just that we're expressing the totality but that the that the poles are coming together right and so it's 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 richer than just this wonderful whole but that they're now associated with each other so instead of it being a it, it's both a, an associative polarity and a moristic polarity we might say yeah. great um this is more of a um you know for our own personal edification and uh both both uh, uh c thomas and ed ship asks, you know, how would Ephraim uh, suggest steps to cultivate wonder in our own lives? Ah, okay. I think that the answer is quite simple. And this is what's so delightful about the asceticism of wonder. Anybody can do it, I think. I mean, with the help of divine grace, as always, right? But um, you read the scriptures. You, that's, that's where the experience of wonder is uh, most potent and most accessible to the average person. And part of the reason I say that is because it's also something that St. Isaac the Syrian, at the other chronological end of the Syriac tradition, all the way in the seventh century, uh, says as well, that that's where the, 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 the wonder comes in the reading, right? Now, I think it would also be true to say that the reading is not just private reading, although it could be that, but it is, uh, it is, Karyana, it is proclamation in the liturgy. So you want wonder, go to church. You want you want wonder, you go to go to liturgy, and uh, and you'll get it. Um, it's uh, so so uh, if um, it, it, it's it, it's precisely that um, eye opening experience of the Eucharist that enables uh, wonder to take place. So we we shouldn't be theologizing apart from the Eucharist and apart from the scriptures, and apart from the natural world. But if we are willing to drink from the sources, they're there for us. So it's not like we have to go off into the desert for 20 years. Um, we just have to go to church. <laughs>
Yeah, well, that's uh, it's good. Uh, thank you for that. Um, a question about this distinction between seeking and investigating. If you may explore that distinction, uh, Hans Gernecker, uh, uh wants to ask that. And uh, kind of following that, Lisa Gilbert asks, if maybe we could consider investigation equivalent to the idea of idle curiosity, um, or is it there's something more insidious involved? Well, um, I would actually, re I would flip that last part around. Idle curiosity is insidious, and it's not necessarily always idle. Uh, even in the Western tradition, there's this, uh, one of the vices is uh, a, an intemperate desire for knowledge. It goes by the name of curiositas. Uh, and I think that Ephraim's understanding of investigation, for which there's a, a large vocabulary, so he sometimes describes it as basatha, uh, which sometimes comes in as prying. There's ukava, which is or uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, which is like tracking down. All of them have certain features in common, though. There's this sense of wanting to assert your own independence, to step back, and uh, to then also to uh, pry into. Right. So there's this kind of uh, sense of uh, rather than uh, allowing the gift to be given, there is this uh, the desire to take it for oneself. Um, and um, you see it brought up in all kinds of biblical examples, the case of Uzziah who tried to touch the ark and was rebuked, the, the case of um, uh, Zechariah in the gospel. Um, but uh, the, the primeval example of audacity is, is, uh, is Adam himself, who rips off the veil uh, of the fruit. Because for Ephraim, the, the, fruit of, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the veil for the tree of life. And so by ripping off the veil, he seeks to get to the fruit of, of the uh, of tree of life and thus um, takes what would have been given to him in time when it was ripe. He characterizes the sin of Adam as a sin of investigation because not because God didn't want him to have the fruit of the tree of life, but because he wasn't ready for it yet. He needed to progress through the proper order, through a certain discipline, through a certain maturation process. So there's a kind of uh, adolescence about the sin of investigation, which is, um, is really important. It, it suggests this immaturity, irrationality, prying, ripping off the veil. Um, it, it, Ephraim will sometimes use the language of, of inquiry, the author, in, its, in, in a more neutral sense. So inquiry, it, it, so long as it's properly disciplined, and he'll use language of measure or bridles, you know, to put it, keep it in its proper place. But I think that wonder really is the, is the bridle for him, because he as, he, as he mentioned that example with John the Evangelist, John, because of his wonder, was in a position to ask questions. And you'll see Ephraim himself doing this. So it's not like you can't ask theological questions. It's you can't presume to be able to define God and limit God and, uh, and uh, try to understand God without relying on God, I think. There, there's, there, there's a whole uh, talk in itself on this particular uh, topic. So I've only just scratched the surface, but perhaps it sheds a little light, I hope. Yeah, there's something very Irenaean that uh, the sin of Adam is a sin made by innocent children and they had to grow in maturity. Do you see that comparison there? there yeah, there is actually a, a, a similarity there. Ephraim describes the, the fir our first parents as, as uh, characterized by Shavrutha, which is immaturity. And so in that sense, it is, it's very Irenaean. Oh, yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, would um, Timothy, Timothy Kelleher asks, uh, first, he, he thanks you for an excellent presentation, but uh, says, did Ephraim have any Christian teachers and or writers in mind when he was speaking about investigators? So you, you, or uh, that's the first part of the question. I think this is another uh, important question. Um, what uh, did Western theologians have much exposure to Ephraim? Um, in the, the late antique, medieval, pre-modern world? So. Okay, so um, who did he have in mind as the target of his critiques? Well, it's sort of twofold. There were the traditional opponents that he uh, 
um, would uh, he was addressing Marcion, who uh, my interpretation this is somewhat disputed among scholars, but I, I tend to think that it's not so much that he's addressing Marcion uh, and followers of Marcion, and, and just by way of recollection for those who don't know, Marcion was the person who denied the unity of the two testaments, who argued that the God of the Old Testament was evil and uh, not the same as the Father of of, the, of uh, Jesus Christ. And um, Ephraim sees that as kind of Marcionism, he sees that as sort of a thread in all heresy, which is really interesting. I actually think that there's a lot of truth to it, that there's, a, there's an element of dualism in, in almost in, in all heresies. Um, but his, his most direct uh, interlocutors that he's probably critiquing are uh, the Manichees um, and uh, the, uh, and some forms of Arians. It's, it, that's also disputed as to which Arian groups he's, he's rejecting or, or critiquing. Um, I'm not convinced one way or the other as to whether it's the uh, radical Anomians, like the followers of Eunomius, or whether it's the, the, uh, uh, some other group. Uh, but a traditional view among many scholars is that it's the radical Anomians. So that basically, the people Ephraim is dealing with are the same people that Basil and Gregory uh, of Nyssa are dealing with. And I think there's a lot to recommend that view, but it's important to note there's not a consensus about that. Um, then um, would Western theologians have had access to Ephraim? Um, I think not, uh, because the, uh, his works were translated into Greek, but um, there was also this rapid growth of spuria, of, of uh, inauthentic works. And uh, so it's not clear that Ephraim's poetry became, was readily accessible to, to, Western, um, to Western thinkers. I can't, I'm not aware of any examples of direct uh, uh, reception or influence, but I will say this, that of all the, of all the, other fathers of the church, the one most like Ephraim in his thinking is probably St. Athanasius himself. So um, I think that uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of the same themes. And, and as we noted, the, the connection to Irenaeus as well. So I would see Ephraim as representing a, uh, a, as being a witness to a common tradition that, that Athanasius also has, even though we don't see evidence of clear influence. But it's an interesting question, and it, it, maybe work needs to be done on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a question from uh, Mikhail Nadav. Uh, he uh, quotes St. Ephraim in his 10th hymn on paradise. He meditates on God's mercy as, quote, his divine cloud hovers over all that is his, drips dew, even upon that fire of punishment so that is mercy. It enables even the fire embittered 
to taste the drops of refreshment. Now, you mentioned that we need wonder at the beginning uh, to be able to taste the sweetness of God, right? For to the sick, even the sweet is embittered, right? Mm -hmm. But here, uh, it seems that God is uh, reaching out uh, to those uh, in the fire of punishment and providing sweetness, uh, even without the palate of them to receive it. So mm -hmm. you see Ephraim talking about anything like universal salvation or or, or what's going on here in this passage, you think? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And uh, I've written another paper about this topic uh, elsewhere. Uh, but, um, uh, and someday I'll hopefully get that published. So I'm really fascinated by it. It's true. There are passages, and, and that one that Mikhail brings up is a good example. There are others. Ephraim will talk about how paradise is the source of blessings to the whole world even the world that's sick it's not like it's cut off even though it is cut off it's sort of this like he wants to acknowledge the 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 real distinction and yet he's not willing Ephraim's not willing to give up on the possibility that paradise even now helps us poor fallen uh uh creatures and and buoys us up and so so there's a kind of ambiguity in Ephraim's thinking, and there are some universalist tendencies, I think it's fair to say. However, um, it's also clear that however, when it, so there's a couple of things about that. Whenever Ephraim is talking about giving God giving his grace to even those who are in really dire straits, who are embittered like this, um, there's uh he he usually couches that in very tentative language so he's saying he he'll usually say something like well um i hope this is the case or if if i may be so bold maybe if i could suggest that it's like this but he's not going to he's not going to stake his claim for it so his 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 thoughts on this are pretty tentative and then there's some other interesting things also in the hymns on paradise where he seems to suggest, and, and then later in the letter to Publius, which is his whole meditation on the last judgment. And what's interesting is that um, God, for Ephraim, I'm, I'm going to just borrow something that I said in another one of my papers. Ephraim seems to be pretty convinced that God does not inflict evil on sinners. Rather, he inflicts good on them. But the problem is that even though it's good, they experience it as torment because of their own disposition. So it's not like God withholds his mercy from anyone. It's simply that um, the, um, the very, he'll, he'll use this language, the very, in the, in the letter to Publius, the very same vision, which gives joy to the righteous in paradise is the thing that torments the damned in Gehenna. Um, now Ephraim's not willing to totally give up on, on the possibility that there's some mercy it has his his own eschatology is different from the way the tradition later developed, and so he's willing to speculate about certain things that later tradition probably wouldn't admit. But but he's also pretty clear that um, that uh, there is uh, he he's, he really does stake his claim on the idea that um, the way a person responds to God's gifts depends on the disposition of the person, and God respects that freedom. He doesn't. He doesn't violate the freedom of the person who rejects him. So I, my own view is that Ephraim is uh, not, in the end, a committed universalist. However, an eminent scholar by the name of Ilaria Ramelli, it's important for me to be fair, uh, takes completely the opposite view. So um, I have read her work and I must respectfully disagree, uh, but uh, it's, it, it is a debated question and there's probably a doctoral dissertation there somewhere, so, or, or two. Well, fantastic. I'm afraid that brings us to the end of our time, but I hope uh, our audience can join me um, in thanking uh, Professor Hayes for uh, just a fantastic engagement um, with Ephraim, a great introduction. Um, even one of our um, audience members here indicated that this was uh, one of their first introductions to um, Eastern Christianity and the Eastern tradition. Um, and that it touched her heart and made her feel very much the same way reading this poetry as she does reading Bonaventure. Um, so I think that we saw some bridge making here um, within this, within our, our shared tradition.
Um, so thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, and thank you, uh, Father Andrew, for a fantastic job moderating. Um, and thank you each for joining. And I hope that you'll join us again next week uh, with uh, Professor Robin Darling Young from Catholic University of America, um, offering a presentation on Christ, the lover of mankind, philanthropia, mystery, and martia in Eastern Christianity. Um, I'm also grateful to all of our co-sponsors who have helped make this series possible. And I invite you to support us. Um, help us get out word to these events. If you take our survey and you mark that you would recommend this to someone else, I invite you to do so. Uh, engage in the practice of recommendation by forwarding on our emails or advertisements to other people. Um, and I also invite you to become a financial supporter today um, by supporting our work at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind goes a long way. Um, one more time, Andrew Hayes and Father Andrew, thank you both, um, especially you, Professor Hayes, for helping us to um, hear more about how we might engage in, uh, in practices of wonder, um, both by looking at the poetry of Ephraim, but also uh, giving us some clear suggestions, uh, engaging scripture, attending liturgy of experiencing this wonder ourselves. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you.